So hello and good afternoon, um, everybody. Welcome to the Marketing Society and the Behavioural Architects webinar, Closing the Intention Action Gap for Sustainable Behaviours. For those of you who hadn't joined just before we started, I'm Rachel Letham. I'm the Head of Content and Communications here at the Marketing Society. And joining me today, we've got Fellow of the Society and Global Chairman of the Behavioural Architects, Crawford Hollingworth, and Global Behavioural Intelligence Director, Liz Barker. So before we start, we do have a lot of non-members joining us today. So welcome to the Marketing Society event. The Society is all about bringing people together to be inspired and to learn and to share best practices. And we are a leading global community of progressive marketeers. The Society empowers senior leaders in marketing by helping them do well in their careers and lives, to do good in their businesses and the world, and by doing so, feel good by being part of a positive community and help shape an industry of which we can all be proud of. So I'll share more about the Marketing Society at the end. Now, we are sharing some thoughts in our members only social media platform today, The Coffee House, which has a thread on, on this webinar. So Linda will be popping the link into the chat for that coffee house. So if you're a member, please do leave your key takeaways in there. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be looking at sustainable behaviors, sharing, three new behavioural science inspired approaches that will make you think differently about how you approach the intention action gap and how to close it. And um, we'll be taking questions later on, so feel free to pop those in the Q&A part, especially if the chat's not working, but hopefully it's back. Okay, so pop your questions into the, the Q&A part and we'll come back to those later. So over to Crawford Hollingworth and Liz Barker, tell us a bit about the behavioural architects. Thanks, Rachel. Um, it's not, I, I see there's still people joining as we speak. Um, so I can see that's whizzing up those numbers. Um, very lovely to see you all today. Uh, thank you for finding the time uh, to join us in, uh, I know what are always very hectic and crazy Januaries that we all have. Um, so I hope a little bit about um, the behavioral architects. Um, I do hope nearly everyone joining us knows who the behavioral architects are. Uh, in a nutshell, just very quickly, um, you always have to say things like this, but we're a multi-award winning global agency. Um, but what's important today is we basically, we use the latest thinking of behavioral sciences to help organizations and help people decode and influence decision-making and behavior. Uh, in fact, if people ask us what the game we're in, we're really in the game of behavioral change and decision-making and behavior. Uh, we work with lots and lots of fab companies around the world, and I'm excited that we've got lots of you joining us today. Um, I guess, of course, it's the nature really of um, sort of behavioral change and the work we do. That means we see kind of firsthand around the world how lots of people are grappling with today's topic, such a hot topic around the world. Um, we need, essentially, we all know we need to change behavior in this kind of weird space we call sustainability. It's a much bigger space than that, as we all know. And I don't think anybody who is joining us today uh, would deny that it is not on their agenda, uh, whether it's you personally, whether it's the organization you work with, or whether it's the customers that you serve. So today, the whole aim of today is really ho hope if we do our jobs right, if Rachel, Liz and me do our jobs right, we will inspire you uh, about how to achieve some of your behavioral change goals within the sustainability sphere. So an overview of the journey we're going to take you on today. Uh, first, we're going to set a little bit of context because context is king and queen. Uh, and when it comes to sustainability, we, we really have to understand that this is a really complex, multidimensional intention action gap. The simple truth is that everyone, everyone is grappling with a vast array of gaps, personal, business, et cetera, in this space. Um, then as we're the behavioral architects, we're going to do a little bit of behavioral psychology because it's always fun to understand why that gap exists. And then the main focus of today's journey, we're going to bring alive, as Rachel said, these three behavioral science inspired approaches that have made, I think has made us really and our clients think a little bit differently about how we deal with that intention action gap and how to reduce it and help more people live sustainable lives which we all need. Now, specifically today, we're gonna to look at how to build more urgency around sometimes, let's be honest, lofty goals of sustainability. I'm gonna use things called irresistible motivations. 
I think that's got you all excited, just that term. Don't you love it? The irresistible motivations. And we're also going to look at how you might leverage these kind of powerful social biases that behavioral science has really helped define and bring alive over the last few years. And then in the final section or the final chunks, we're going to look at ways of making that sustainable action you desire, you want, feel less daunting, you know, less like a kind of unscalable market, mountain or I guess the proverbial elephant. Um, so hopefully everyone's excited. I can see there's many of you on it. So hold tight and let's get going. Let's start with what is the intention action gap and make sure we're all on the same page. Now, again, the concept is essentially that when we have the best intentions of doing something and often with the knowledge or the understanding of why we should do it we just don't we don't do it uh, i wish i could see all your faces because i'm sure at this point you're all nodding at the screen you all recognize that in yourself and in your customers this is the gap and i apologize i kind of find myself feel like it should be a hollywood voiceover coming on you know um when they set the objective to save the planet, little did they know the yearning chasm that, <laughs> that would face them between intention and, and actual action. Uh, I'm sorry, but that is actually the truth. That's where we are. And, and honestly, when you think about the intention action gap in general in our lives, looking at this chart, you can look at this later, um, even though these things are incredibly important, all of these things are, sustainability is just one of many, many gaps that we wrestle with in our world. Uh, in our model here, we just coined a really simple phrase, which is your intention self versus your action self. And we love this term. Uh, and we find ourselves continually asking ourselves, you know, which one am I in? Are I still in the intention of I now moved into the action? But a simple thing just to challenge yourself. And if we then zero in on just one of those many, many gaps into sustainability in particular, once again, you can look at this in the deck, you'll see it's not one gap. It's loads and loads of different gaps. In fact, sustainability is probably not a great collective term um, because the gaps are, as you can see, so vast and varied from how we work, literally what you've probably done today, how we eat, what you've eaten today, how we use our homes, you know, how we travel to work or any other way, even how we manage our money if we're lucky enough to have any. And what we know is we need to get really cleverer understanding all of these at a deeper behavioral level at all those gaps uh, loads of gaps and it's great just to think about more you know actually recently just in a study by Cantor, um, which again you'll see this data in the, in the charts they found 92 percent of people don't bother reading the charts you don't need to and um, 92 percent of people say they want to live a sustainable life or a more sustainable life yet only 16 percent are changing their behavior what a huge gap that is. 83% of people with intentions to act more sustainably are not changing their behavior. And if you look at the next chart, I'm really going to test you today um, at the next study. This, this is a great chart in the deck that you can look at in much more detail because it looks at lots and lots of different gaps in sustainability across lots of aspects of life. It's a great study. Uh, right now, I'm putting it there as an eye test for you all. Uh, but trust me, it just shows so much concern and attention we all have, and then so much, so little action across our lives. We all care so much and do very, very little about any of it. So you get the picture. There's a lot of big gaps. I'll stop my Hollywood voice in a moment. Gaps we need to tackle in our business behavior, in our customer behavior, in our own behavior. And we need to all think a bit more about why when we want to do something, which you all do, we don't. It's as simple as that. We want to do something, but we don't. And, and as you probably know, there are a, a mass of reasons, a mass of reasons which are holding you in that kind of intention self versus that action self that we all need. And basically they all create a sense of what I would call dreaded hesitancy if you like that term, dreaded hesitancy. Reasons such as the sustainable action may feel it's too daunting or it's too large. Um, there are often these kind of massive behavioral change challenges. You know, change how you eat is not very easy. Refit your home is not that simple. And so lots of our, uh, also lots of our current behavior will be really deeply ingrained habits, 
which are chains, which are hard to break. And sometimes we just don't know what we're meant to do. Let's be honest. There's an awful lot of ego jargon out there. Well, maybe you just don't have the ability to do it. You know, sustainable choices, uh, you know, are not yet the default. We have to go out of our way. We have to try really hard to make them happen. Or maybe you just sit around and go, oh, well, no one else is doing it. So why should I bother? Another one we see a lot of. So for most of us, it's so much easier to intend versus to act. And because of the barriers or beliefs like this, the gap gets bigger and bigger. Your action self is somewhere on the horizon. Uh, yet bizarrely, you might pat yourself on the back for at least having the intention. So let's quickly put a behavioral science lens on these common reasons. And I, I hope you love this. These behavioral science concepts will help us think more strategically about how to approach the gaps we all are facing. The wonderful present bias, or put another way, we like our present self and that lovely status quo feeling it gives us. And climate change has, maybe until quite recently, always be, been presented as something happening a long time in the future. So it's really easy to kick that can down the road. But also the lack of behavioral feedback, really important thing in behavioral change. You know, one of the big problems with anything around sustainability and climate change is that change happens so slowly. So even if we drastically reduce our carbon footprint and become greener today, there'll be years before we see any impact. And there, there is often no tangible, immediate, real, I guess, kind of reward or feedback. And that can quickly drain motivation. We all need some sense of impact, you know, or some sense of progress. Um, and again, look at the world we live in, uh, in this space. There's so much cognitive strain in this sustainable area. And as the wonderful Thaler said, the key to behavioral change is to keep it easy, easy, easy. Three very important words. Often choosing the sustainable choice presented to us in this day and age, is not easy. Yeah, it's not easy to do. It may be hard to understand. And sometimes the change needed seems like a mountain we're not quite willing to climb. And many of these areas of needed change bring with them also this sense of loss aversion. Loss aversion is a really powerful concept. It's very much connected to present bias and to status quo bias. But living sustainably has often been framed as needing to stop doing things that you and me enjoy, you know, or you and me find convenient, convenient, such as drive your car, you know, or fly, or eat meat, or buy new things. And psychologically, therefore, this whole thing builds up this feeling of loss and therefore loss aversion. So I hope you can quickly see how thinking with this framework, this really cool behavioral science framework, helps you understand why so many attempts to change behavior have failed. Um, we see many, many examples of the obvious things we people first do, which is let's give everyone lots of information. Let's tell them, because surely knowledge is power especially when climate change is so threatening to life and society. Tell them knowledge, and I'm sure, you know, they're going to change their behavior. And it takes us into many of these old behavioral change models that you will recognize, which are essentially rational, linear behavioral change models, um, such as the really crazy named trans-theoretical stages of change. Try saying that late at night, or the Ada Martin model. Um, they can be helpful uh, in some circumstances, so don't, I'm not saying they're not. Uh, and surprisingly, I think they're probably still too influential in the world of marketing. Um, and the issue with these type of model is they don't take into account really simple things like how awareness and knowledge does not automatically convert to behavioral change, as you all know. The fact that people can start a new behavior without actually going through awareness, intention and desire, which I love. Whereas uh, Takeda Shingen said, I hope I pronounced that correctly, knowledge is not power, it is only potential. Good quote, isn't it? Knowledge is not power, it's only potential. And the marketing world, I promise you, has sustainability graveyards all over uh, of case studies using these models that we should all learn from. And we've included a few in our presentation, but you can learn a lot from why they failed, just given information and knowledge. So the bottom line, everyone, is sustainability gaps are vast and varied with so many behavioral barriers that in order to bridge these gaps, which we have to do as a society, we need to get clever. We need to think how to outsmart, in a sense, that tendency to stay in the intention mode. And in this quest, behavioral science is your friend. 
And this brings us on to the main focus of today and our journey and to show you how insights from behavioral science can help us think differently about the gaps and help people live in more sustainable ways. Huzzah, I hear you all saying. And we're now trying to bring alive these three areas I mentioned earlier. And for each of these three areas, we will explain what they are a bit more, why they can be effective in your strategies. And we will bring alive with real case studies that I hope will inspire, make you think differently, and make you enjoy this session and your valuable time. So moving on to the first one, uh, and the infectious language that I've already told you how much I love, building irresistible personal motivations. Now, obviously, you know, you're all marketeers. You know, we all know building motivation is important. But what behavioral science gives us is tools and frameworks and techniques that really add not only to our understanding, but critically our ability to build more personal, more compelling motivations, which is so important with the massive intention action gaps we mentioned earlier. Such as you know, new sustainable behaviors needed can often, and think of them again, they can often seem so meta, um, so huge. They create almost, I don't know, almost the word I could use would be learned helplessness. You know, they can feel so distant or so abstract uh, and sort of, even how bizarre this sound, they can see that they lack a sense of must do now urgency. And it's really hard to create urgency around big meta challenges like climate change, where often people, as I say, lack this locus of control, you know, or empowerment they feel to have impact. If I do anything, it won't make a difference. And what you see on this chart is a really, I think it's just an incredibly simple, but critical behavioral science contextual model. Behavioral science always looks at behavior in context. And just that's a really simple question, again, which we don't, I think, ask ourselves enough in this space. How can you bring in an action to make it closer, to make it more personal, to build more personal relevance and, and that lovely term, irresistible personal motivation. So the action you want me to take, I wanna do for me maybe, what I wanna do for my family or my community. How can you unlock that? great, powerful, motivational energy. And behavioral science helps us think further about this model and to push us beyond that system two, a rational approach that currently dominates, honestly dominates this landscape. It gives us these proven kind of scientific concepts to force our thinking. Because when thinking about change, we can leverage these concepts more strategically, such as framing, you know, think how we can reframe a behavior to highlight personal benefits, you know, and always remember there is always more than one frame. I love frame and always more than one frame. Or well, think how to dial up the effects bias. You know, we all know emotional response will often drive our decision making rather than any logic you can put forward. Or again, let's go to another one. Yeah, the kind of powerful present bias. This is so cool. Sorry, I'm going back in wrong order, but I'm like talking about it. We all tend to prioritize reward and enjoyment today. Come on, we all do. And it's even and this is even more so, by the way, when times are difficult, which they are at the moment in the world. That's probably the biggest under understatement, <laughs> the difficult times. And right now, this will be working against so many sustainable behavioral goals. The world we live in is in chaos. So we might need so, so how might we anchor? You know, how might we anchor a sustainable behavioral change to reward or benefit today? I think about that present bias, you know, versus kind of somewhere in the future, which we can just discount. How do we play to the present diet bias and give that action a real sense of urgency? It's a really interesting concept, present bias, really worth thinking about. In a nutshell, what I think I'm saying here is how do you appeal much more to system one? Think short-term rewards, think short-term paybacks, think personal and emotional rewards or connections, and you will begin to see change. So let's pause for a second and let's bring this alive with an award-winning piece of behavioral change work that some of you I know will know about. Um, shamelessly by the wonderful behavioral architects. I apologize for that. Uh, where the gap between intention and action was bridged beautifully. So um, on a cold London day, let's go down under uh, to Australia and in fact to Greater Sydney. If 
a place particularly prone to a really groovy science concept called the Urban Heat Island. If anyone wants to know more about that, direct message me because it's a great concept. But essentially city temperatures get much higher than in rural areas. And the fact that trees, lovely trees, are a great way of keeping cities cooler, keeping cities healthier, making them more resilient to climate change. But sadly, what we've seen is urbanization has left, in this case, Greater Sydney, very much as this image shows, black and white and lacking green or any color. Uh, so the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, again, try saying that at night, set out to re-green Greater Sydney in 2021, 2021, with a target of 1 million, 1 million new trees planted by people like you and me. And suddenly what we saw was a massive, massive gap opened up. All the data showed that most people agree with the goal. In fact, in fact, most people love the idea of tree planting. But again, a big, big but. They didn't fancy the idea in their own backyards, NIMBY, eh? And they lacked the personal motivation to get on their knees and actually dig a hole. So New South Wales Department called the behavioral gap busters, us. And we did a lot of really fascinating behavioral research. And what we found, and I hope you love this, was that Sydney residents, but there's a massive variation in what they thought about trees. We found lots of people who actually love them and love them in the outdoor space. And then lots of people who saw them as a big nuisance. They associate trees with just large public spaces. And we're talking about planting in a private space. This unlocked, I hope you're going to like this term, this unlocked a negative availability system one cascade. Oh, I like that. Negative availability, system one cascade. I tell you what, no one wants one of those. So, the, And we also found that the very use of the word tree was a huge barrier to anyone planting one, the word tree. Um, our research unlocked what is great about behavioral research is one great important insight. And for us, what we call the real behavioral aha moment. Uh, we learned that people don't necessarily plant trees. They plant solutions to problems. I'm going to read that again. People don't plant trees. They plant solutions to problems. Such simple insights are always so simple um, when, when, you haven't, when you've got them. Um, and again, um, let's ex explore that a little bit. We found people who planted trees um, or wanted them, they wanted to solve a problem or they wanted to satisfy um, a deeper need, you know, a desire for shade. It's very hot in Sydney at the moment. A uh, desire for privacy, uh, a desire for fruit, you know, or just fragrance from the trees or colour or wildlife. And suddenly I can see all your heads lifting up and going, oh, I get this now. And when these benefits of trees were given real saliency, a very different set of associations are unlocked. You know, using that great term saliency again. In fact, now, because we're on a bit of a roll here, positive availability, system one cascade took place of really good positive associations. And this understanding led to a really powerful award-winning campaign to give this saliency real life, that it really stand out uh, and build new appealing vocabulary. And as much as we possibly could in all the work to avoid mentioning the word tree at all. Um, I hope you love these examples. I'll hold there for a moment. Look at the right hand side. Those are some of the advertising. You can get a sense of what it's about. Need more privacy. Want to wake up to bird song? Well, I can hear everyone on this call already rushing off to plant a tree in their own garden. So remember when we started off in the end of 2021, uh, we had this great um, campaign, by the way, which became known as the Everyone Plant One campaign, which is a great, a great term. Crazy target of one million trees. Madness, I hear you say. But the target was surpassed within a year by the end of 2022 and is continuing to grow. So and a major, major achievement that is. I'm going to very briefly talk about one more case study and then I'm going to hand over to Liz to talk about the second area. This really is a bit of, I guess, just for you guys, food for thought. It's quite a complicated area, but at a top line level, it's a great example of, making some desired action more contextually relevant, more contextually motivating to the target versus a meta or product or service centric proposition. And the area of heat pumps, and I'll let you read this in the deck later. 
But again, you know, changing your house to heat pumps is not an easy thing. It's complex, it's expensive. Uh, a great way of reducing your carbon footprint, but for a lot of us, it's got like, whoa, way too complicated, way too expensive. This is a great piece of work, really simple. And he looked at conventional anchoring, a well-known behavioral science term. And as you can see here, this anchors to health benefits. That's very much a conventional thing, saying it's healthier, versus this next chart, which is about anchoring to more immediate wealth benefits. Everyone now lifts their heads up on this call, as seen here. And this new work about kind of wealth, uh, it's still very much early days, but again, showed statistically really strongly that talking wealth significantly increase people's engagement, people's interest in this subject and this conversion versus more traditional health anchors. So it's really, really worth thinking laterally. And I love this, thinking laterally about what benefits you might you know, anchor an action to. And the anchor you use could be the difference between intention and action that you want. I'm gonna move now into the second area. Hand over to Liz, our Director of Global Intelligence. Although as I say that, it makes us sound like a spy. Maybe I should say, I'm gonna hand over to Elle. Thank you. <laughs> well, Liz, <clears throat> thanks Crawford. So our first area looked at building more urgency, more must do urgency, using the pull factor of personal benefits to put intent into action. And our second area is gonna look at how we can close that gap using a different sort of pull factor, that of social pressure. And behavioral scientists have found that this drives urgency because we hate not fitting in. So like the first area, it's a very emotional driver of motivation. Now, those of you familiar with behavioral science will know social pressure. I'm sure you've read about it lots of times, but I'm just gonna give you a hint that today we're looking at a new, slightly less well-known finding today. So please stay with us. So behavioral science offers us a wealth of tools to create social pressure. And we're gonna look at two to help close this gap. The first is how we can make social and dynamic norms more visible. So social norms say that we like to do what others are doing, especially those who are close to us, our friends, our families, our colleagues. And messaging to convey that the majority of other people are taking action is a very common tool. I'm sure you've seen messages which say, join the 80% of people who are doing action X. They're everywhere. Dynamic norms are when behavior change is accelerating and growing. One by one, people are adopting something new, but it might not have reached the majority yet. Researchers have found that communicating this acceleration can drive others to change too. So a recent study told people queuing in a canteen for their lunch that research in the last five years said that three in 10 Americans have changed their behavior and begun to eat less meat than they otherwise would. And reading that message, um, people were much more likely to order a meat-free meal. But we can communicate these norms without overt messaging like this, because we know from research that the more visible or observable a new behavior or trend is, the more likely others will adopt it anyway. So rather than using messaging that we have to read, we can convey social change by just making it more visible so that people see and hear the change around them. We're always searching out the novel. We notice new things. Our brains are wired to spot changes. So could we make existing norms more visible or create that feeling around us, a sort of subconscious feeling that more and more people are beginning to change their behavior? The second area I want to talk about is how we can correct social, uh, so, sorry, correct normative bubbles or pop normative bubbles. Normative bubbles recognize that sometimes we miss judge the social reality. We might think that a new action makes sense and really privately want to do it, perhaps change to a more sustainable bank. But we don't do it because we think others don't approve or others wouldn't do it. When actually others think exactly the same as us. So the social change organization Rare conducted a really cool study to measure the extent of misperceptions for seven sustainable behaviors. And they found that Americans thought only three in 10 people they knew thought people should install solar panels. Yet the reality was six in 10 people. And this is what's called the normative bubble. Sometimes we need to correct people's misperceptions and so they feel that social approval so they can go out and really do what they believe in. 
So we've got these tools. Next, we're gonna look at two real world examples of where we can leverage these tools to increase sustainable behaviors. These images of huge landfill probably don't make you or me feel good. And of course, landfill is not sustainable. It pollutes, it's costly to manage, it's probably the most expensive place to put our rubbish. It suffers from nimbyism, just like trees. Um, no one wants to look at a rubbish dump. And in many places, actually landfill is full. So how can we persuade people to send less to landfill? So at Halifax in Canada, this is not in the UK, um, had this, wanted to tackle this problem. Um, and it was expensive, you know, the landfill was expensive and, and their existing landfills were full. Households could recycle all the usual stuff, but any other items could be sent to landfill. And there lay the problem. You can hide anything in a black bag. And often households were a little lazy and weren't segregating their landfill from their recycling. Who can identify with that and admit to being a little bit lazy sometimes? So in 2015, they implemented this clear bag policy for household landfill waste. The idea behind the clear bags was twofold. One, the garbage collectors could instantly scan and see if there were any recyclable materials in the bags. And here's the really, <laughs> the really shameful bit. If, if they did spot anything, they would slap it with a big red rejection notice. The shame of getting one of those. Um, and of course, all your neighbours can see that you've had a red re rejection sticker and that, you know, your bag's still on the pavement. And of course, it also allowed the rest of the community to sort of have a little nosy around and see who was recycling and who was not. So your neighbours could now see what you were throwing out in the wrong bag. So what impact did this um, initiative have? Two years later, landfill had decreased uh, by 24%. Overall waste had fallen as well. Recycling had increased, organic waste had increased. Households simply put more effort into sorting items because they knew they were being watched. They knew that if they, were put out, if they put it out on the street, they'd be watched by their neighbors and the garbage disposal teams. So it's a great example of a covert social norm message. The clear bag policy made a behavior more visible to others and it saved money too. Um, one and a half million dollars over two years. I'm going to now show a short video um, from a Canadian news channel. Uh, Just bear with me. Well, it's coming up on a year since the Halifax Regional Municipality implemented clear bags for garbage. While some were skeptical of the change, the numbers show it is helping clean up a messy business. Your CTV's Kellen Sundahl. <laughs> We first met Corey Canfield a week before see-through bags became mandatory. One year later, he's seen a clear improvement. The amount of garbage in general has gone down. And that garbage ends up here at the landfill, where it's separated and sorted. And they're not the only ones looking at our trash. City officials, too, have been sorting through our stuff. Since clear bags became mandatory, there's less waste and more recycling. Contents can no longer be hidden in black bags with the exception of a privacy bag. The city estimates a 24% reduction at the landfill and a 15% increase at the recycling depot. Now there are plans to expand that facility. It was beyond our, our wildest imaginations. These results exceeding the expectations of even the manager of solid waste. For every ton that doesn't go to the facility, we don't pay for that ton to go to the facility and be processed. So far, a savings of $1.5 million on 10,000 tons. One area that still needs work is separating paper. From so I hope you enjoyed that little excerpt. Um, I think it helps bring to life um, just how, how effective that policy was. So our second example I want to show you today um, looks at how we can make dynamic norms more visible to help close the gap. Many people, I'm sure you've got friends, say that they intend to purchase an electric car or install solar panels on their houses, but perhaps some are a little bit hesitant still. For electric cars in the UK, 43% of those asked said that they were willing to switch to an electric car, yet only 3% have switched. For solar panels, 
in the UK, 60% of homes intend to install solar, yet only 4% of homes have it. But there's some evidence that this gap is being closed simply by how visible these sustainable purchases are. If we look at solar, when researchers used machine learning to analyze spatial data of neighborhoods, they found the main driver for the uptake of solar panels was being within 200 meters of another house with solar panels. They show up as geographical clusters on maps like the images on this slide. Porfin and I like to call this the keeping up with the Joneses effect. And data for electric cars is the same. If we think about it, both these products are highly visible. We can't help but notice solar panels on the roofs around us or see them being installed. EVs are even more visible. That unique whir of the drive sound, the ding ding reversing sound, the green number plates, the home charging points on the walls. The mechanism might help encourage word of mouth too. Being able to see these products might prompt discussions with your solar or EV buying neighbor where you learn more and are persuaded to buy more, buy too. And other behaviors have been made more visible in recent years like voting. So what other sustainable behaviors could we make more visible in how we design them so people get a sense of social change? I'm gonna hand you back to Crawford now for our third and last area. Thanks Liz, I love all the ding ding there as well. Um, loving that plastic bag one as well. Um, it's actually it's so embarrassing everybody because I, I got my, my local council, is, which is Oxford, I live in the middle of Oxford, um, they didn't like my, uh, my landfill bin the other day because I put too much in it and they put a big tag on it, um, uh, which was very clear to all the neighbours and offered me to be a re-education programme in household rubbish disposal. A re-education programme. I love that. It's so Oxford, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to do an MBA in home rubbish re-education. Anyway, thank you, Liz. A really interesting area. And the third area, everyone, and, and I hope you're going to love this last one as well. Uh, and it looks at it from a different, a different point of view. It, it's not about increasing intentions, this, but actually coming from the other side. Uh, and looking at how we might bring the behavior um, a little bit, the action we want, a little bit more in reach. And again, behavioral science research is constantly showing us, you've all seen this, that how we conceptualize, how we structure a consumer journey uh, can mean the difference between action or inaction. You know, we can structure uh, a journey to feel easier. We can structure a journey to feel less cognitively draining of, you know, God, it's so hard. And in this case, in this webinar today, how we can use behavioral science to help us how to make, uh, in a sense, that yearning chasm or gap feel a lot smaller, which is just a great thought in your head. Um, so, and again, we're gonna look at how to make it smaller. And that can be, by the way, it can be literally, or it can also be perceptually, okay? To shrink the gap, the gap. So first, just ask yourself the question, how can you make an action we want someone to take? How can you make it easier? Ask how we might remove some of the behavioral friction. Another term which I love that behavioral science gave us, behavioral friction that gets in the way of someone doing something we want. Uh, it could be cognitive friction. It could be physical friction. It could be a, an emotional frictional barrier. But think, whichever they are, how can you dial them down or remove? Second, ask yourself, and this is an area we focus on a lot, how can we build what we behavioral scientists call more cognitive ease, okay? How can we make what we want someone to do feel easier, feel easy, feel easy to grasp what you want them to do, you know, or easy just to get one's head around. So we can actually just act, just do it, and I don't need to think too hard about it. Again, I bet you all recognize that. Just easy, so I just don't need to think. It just makes sense and it's easy to do. And lastly, and the one I'm gonna focus on a bit now in the last, this last session, uh, in the next few examples, how can we maybe reframe the gap as a journey, uh, a series, if you like, of steps? Um, it's not a gap like this. It's actually, you have to leap across it in one go. You can do it in small chunks one step at a time. And you all know this, but often we don't use it in the, the own challenges we have. It's a common life hack. 
that trying to achieve a goal to focus on the journey itself is really, really important rather than obsessing about how close or far away you are to the goal. The journey itself, one step at a time, a really important life hack. In fact, even can you go further, and behavioral science has shown us that maybe think how we can enjoy the journey. Forget the goal, enjoy the journey, celebrate each little step forward. And as we all know in nearly everything in life, you know, uh, we're going to start singing like the first step is the hardest. The first cut is the deepest. The first momentum is the hardest. Uh, and here is a great but simple example to bring that alive. To state the obvious uh, on a webinar that you've all joined today, climate emergency is upon us. Almost every day there's a flood, a wild fire or hurricanes and or another named storm. What is it? We name every storm now. Every storm is catastrophic. And it really feels as someone getting older or someone being old, it's a place I've not known before. Uh, and to quote a cliche, we, you, all of us today are part of the solution. And we all need to take action to mitigate these negative effects and to cut our carbon footprint. And one simple area, as you see here, is eating less meat and dairy. This would drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and water and land use more than I think anyone can believe. But let me tell you about the gap, the gap we face here. Many of us want to do this. Many of us lean into this idea, idea of eating less meat and less dairy. In fact, even in 2023, the Food Standards of Scotland, which I always love referring to, showed that although 67% of people want to reduce their meat consumption, only 22% do this. That's one big gap, intention and action. The next case study is a great way of making meat-free action feel easier and therefore more attainable. And again, should inspire lots of ideas in you. And it's the wonderful that you'll know, but it's the wonderful Meat Free Mondays campaign. This simply made it easier to eat less meat by making the goal smaller, making it simpler, making it more precise and therefore more attainable. Just one meat-free meal a week. That sounds really easy, doesn't it? Now, Paul McCartney, uh, co-founder of the campaign and part-time musician, uh, says the uh, environmental impact is substantial. If every person in Great Britain skipped meat for one day, it would reduce our carbon footprint by more than if every car was taken off the road for a whole day. Isn't that extraordinary? Every car for a whole day. Love it. In fact, I might have to sing again. Paul McCartney's got me going. Whispering words of wisdom, let it be, let it be. Oh, come on, that's got to go. Anyway, so we meet Free Mondays. The behavioral theory is another great theory which works, I promise you. We achieve small wins, e.g. one day, it then can often snowball. And lots of stuff we do starts with small wins that then snowball. And this campaign facts are super impressive. According to like a 2021 survey by Brighton and Sussex Medical School, along with Meat Free Mondays, one in three Meat Free Monday participants became vegetarian after five years. Isn't that extraordinary? What a great snowballing impact. And finally, because running out of time and super brief, brief, I want to just also touch on another area I know everyone will think about, which is food wastage. wastage. Did you know food wastage contributes as much as 10% of our global greenhouse gas emissions? 10% from food waste. And everyone would like to reduce the amount of food they waste. Come on, everyone would. Uh, and it's, but it's not easy. Uh, and in fact, 60% of all food waste happens at home. So we are in control of this. Um, another great um, behavioral science company, not us, but BE Works, did this research working with Hellman's. Um, and they found households really struggle to know how to use leftovers uh, and in, in what is, let's say, a creative and appealing way to the people they're cooking meals for. In their own words, because I'll use their words here because it's not my research, we all know that nothing, that nothing to eat, particularly you're tired, you're hungry, you're staring into that empty fridge, um, but with the right recipe, and obviously a dollop of Hellman's, those odds and ends can become a tasty dish. And that's why they created, again, I love the term, the Hellman hacks. 
the helm and hat. What B works created was actually a two-pronged, what we call a two-pronged behavioral motivational strategy, a two-pronged behavioral change motivational strategy. What they were doing, one was they were boosting what we call food repurposing, and they used this simple formula called the three plus one rule, and Hellman will be one of those, obviously the one. And then inspiring creativity by giving you a motivation, by giving you loads of loads of recipes, loads of simple things you could do. Simple, really cool, really cool piece of work. And in the trial, um, um, in what we found was the leftover hacks cut food waste, cut food waste by 33%. That's a fantastic result. 900 Canadian households and 64% were still using the three plus mental rule um, uh, two months later. Uh, again, so the behavior is sticking. And I'd say that was a pretty amazing and simple thing to do. Again, a lovely way of making something that seems really hard, food waste, really close, simple things we can all do. So everyone. Crawford, Crawford just quickly, because the question's coming that's very into this section. Was that six or 60% of food waste that comes from households? Sorry, from, from uh, food waste contributes 10%. 10%, thank uh, you. 60% of all food waste comes from the home. Is that, is that okay? So, Carry on. So 10% of our global greenhouse gas emissions comes from food waste, and 60% of all food waste comes from your home. I'm going to carry on, assuming everyone's happy there. If, if any, if, if the stats, if people want to come back on the stats, I can do that later. Um, but I need to, conscious of the time, unfortunately, I have to stop this section. I could talk a lot more about this section. I move into our summary. Um, so um, I really hope what you've seen today is something quite simple, but how behavioral science really helps you just, I don't know, to look at this kind of vast and varied amount of gaps, intention action gaps we're struggling with just a little differently. And we need to look at them a little differently because so many failed attempts to bridge them you know, are out there. And I really hope that it's given you the source of an idea, whether it's in your organization, whether it's in the customers you serve, even whether it's in your home life, it's given you some new strategic frameworks and tool to inspire your thinking and to help you think about, you know, I'm gonna to have to say again, you know that, to how to build those irresistible personal motivations. So love that term. To make those motivations closer to you versus those more meta kind of intangible frames we see constantly used in this space around the world. Or think about as Liz went, I love those super cool use of things like social pressure, you know, or dynamic social norms, even that term excites me, you know, or injunctive social norms, or even how to bust some normative bubbles. Let's all go and bust some normative bubbles today. It's turned, you know, behavioral science has given us such a gift in this space. It's turned kind of like a unilateral thing called social norms into a multi-dimensional concept that can help you think really strategically about how you, how you make harness, you know, the, um, how you might harness in a different way for maximum behavioral change, which I think is what you all want. There are so many ways. And then finally, we literally looked at the, uh, at the problem from the other side, um, which I love. How do we make the gap smaller? How do we remove that friction? How do we build more cognitive ease or just chunk that journey into smaller, more manageable steps? So a massive thank you for your listening today. Um, we do appreciate your valuable time. Um, obviously, if you want more information on these amazing case studies, on this amazing work, uh, there's lots of links. Uh, again, a copy of the deck, a copy of the recording, um, me to come and label your bins. Please let us at the Behavioral Architects know, or, or Rachel at the Marketing Society, and we can do all that. And I guess, let's have a bit of a final peak end, because you know in behavioral science, we all need a bit of a final peak end. And one final nudge and help you here, everyone listening, to move. I know an intention you've got in your minds now, a real burning intention. Let's today move it into action and let's send that new brief to the behavioral architects and let's join the marketing society. Big thanks, you, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we have a little bit of time for a few questions. I know lots of people will dash off, but thank you for joining us. And I know Rachel would like to say a couple more words about 
the wonderful Martin Society that I'm proud to be a fellow of. I will. Thank you. But first of all, let's do some questions. That was amazing. Thank you, Crawford and Liz. Really um, fabulous. I think the stats sort of blew me away a bit, but also made me think about my own short term personal rewards to, to change behaviour um, and making sure I stay in that intention mode. So very useful. Thank you. Liz, can you just share the slide again? Sorry, just so we keep the QR code up for feedback and um, a bit about the Marty Society. So um, a couple of questions here. So Mark Earl said, really interesting framing, but he's intrigued how much you think what we really want to do versus the stuff that we don't. So is there a difference between when we say we intend to do something and then we actually intend to do it? Or is some of it merely kind of social noise? Um, well, a good question. I mean, obviously I think that, uh, that it just depends on the area you're in, but obviously there's a lot of, you know, kind of green flag waving. So everyone wants to say they want to do something. Um, so I think in certain areas, there's a lot of that. Um, and I guess, as you know, I would say, LZ, is that whatever you're looking at, you need to understand what are the current, what are the current barriers. You need the behavioral search to understand why someone is not doing something. Or if the intention is there, how much of that intention actually is just, I don't know, just kind of bluff, because uh, it will exist. Um, and I'm, I'm sure all of us, you know, um, lots of behavioral change we've seen in this space has happened because of legislation, despite the fact we've all had intention, we only do it because we don't do it, they're not going to take our bins away. So of course, you know, there are areas where, you know, actually, people's claimed intention won't be as high as is true. And for those people, we need to legislate against. <laughs> I think um, also we can measure intentions more effectively or less effectively, um, depending on the, the, the sort of strategy we use. Um, we all know that sort of the fallbacks of um, or the downfalls of focus groups. Um, people are pressured to say what they, you know, they, they feel others, the, the general momentum in the room. Um, but we've done a lot of work designing questionnaires and surveys um, so that you actually elicit the most honest response out of someone. So just because someone says their intention is something you want to look at what's or how was that measured, I think, to really gauge whether there's how much truth there is behind it. And I'm going to add one other thing as well, actually. Thanks, Liz. I think lots of things that we look at in this space, um, sometimes we actually don't then work on the intention and the energy and the intention we actually work on the action because sometimes actually you can make the action so appealing and easy that people just do it even if they didn't really have the intention to start with so that's the kind of reverse logic there which is quite powerful yeah we, we didn't really go into you know auto enrolling people into programs because you know we that's been covered quite a lot but there are schemes in germany for example that um enrolled people into the default green tariff and the uptake was huge. Very few people opted out in that. And, you know, there was no, whether there was an intention action gap there, it didn't really matter because people were, were defaulted into that. I think it's, by the way, whatever you're working in, everyone, it's always good to think about where you are because it goes, makes me think, Elsie, again, going back to like working on, you know, stop smoking campaigns, everyone wants to, but they found it really hard. And eventually the law changed it and made it, made it happen. Let's not talk about vaping now because I don't want to get into that. Let's let's move on to another question. So William Wright, who has had to leave, but we'll we'll have the recording uh, sent out, said, I wonder how these approaches need to be modified depending on the complexity or cha how chaotic the environment is for the decision maker. Yeah, I mean, I, w without a doubt, I mean, the context of any behaviour you're trying to change is critical and you have to deep dive into behavioural search to unlock and understand that context. And lots of times you'll feel, you'll find that actually you might not have the ability to change the behavior you want because of the complexity of that context. So that's why, I mean, the beauty of behavioral science is it allows you to understand the behavior you seek to change and hopefully then inspire ways of changing it. But it can also tell you lots of things you're doing are never gonna work because the context is way too complex, uh, yeah. way too many barriers uh, already there. Sorry, Liz. Yeah, I think um, obviously, you know, some behavior is is sort of observable in lots of different contexts. Um, but the whether the solution, you know, we've, we've presented lots of different solutions here, whether the solution will work in other contexts, 
I think you need to look at two aspects and one is what are the local what are your conditions like what's your context like and then what's the capacity for implementing the solution you've seen somewhere else can you actually do what what you know the Canadian government has done or can you do what um, Sydney's done is it actually feasible where you are so I think having a look at, at both those two aspects um, is is really crucial Okay, and another question from Tamsin Hussey. Where is the focus on closing the gap related to sustainability coming from, from your perspective? So she says she doesn't see much dedicated focus from business other than the usual suspects like Unilever, Ikea, Patagonia. So where is the focus coming from? I love the accusation as the usual suspects. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a really good question. And I guess um, it, the it's one of the honest feelings we have at the moment is the events of last year um, have really taken the focus back off um, sustainability. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure the planet's gonna wait. Um, and, you know, we know at the moment you go to any marketing department around on this call today and all the people I know, and everyone's obsessed at the moment with what does AI mean? Uh, it's really easy for it to fall off the table. Um, the fact is it's not a choice. You know, we, at some point, you know, even if it becomes too late and we have to manage what we've got, we have to change our footprint. Um, but I, I really, sadly, I recognize that question because I do think there's a, the energy has dropped um, and it's really easy to, to move away from this as the top of your agenda. I think even in the Martin Society, I might have mentioned before Christmas that, you know, that it had dropped down on a lot of the Martin Society's uh, members um, list uh, in terms of importance but I may have misread that but mm. yeah and, and Davos actually rated disinformation and misinformation as its top threat yeah. um, this year and then this, uh, although climate change was second I think in the actual event the week it was hardly discussed at all it was all wars and um, you know <laughs> how to solve the the US political problem and I, I don't think climate change was really mentioned at all. So it's definitely just recently sort of fallen down people's priority list. But I think I, I think we're just going to see keep on seeing more extreme weather events, which are going to bring it to the fore again. Yeah, and I think again, I mean, uh, you know, I'm hoping there'll be more and more legislation as well. I think you know, cities are changing. Um, you know, um, London changes all the time about where you can drive and what you can drive in. Um, and I think there'll be more and more tax on, you know, energy use of houses and things. So I think things will change through legislation as well. Um, but it's it's very easy for this to fall off the table and it's not a good time for it to fall off the table. Okay, well, thank you for that. So we will collate some of the tips and learnings from today to share with you all. We'll be sharing um, the recording and as Corfer said, we will be sharing the slides. So thank you for that. If you've enjoyed... You can I just say something? Because I don't want to end on a negative there. Because I think, honestly, I think that, you know, it is our, you know, I know that a lot of our world is short term. A lot of politics is short term. You know, a lot of marketing is short term. You know, I don't think brands are short term. Um, but I think it is, you know, we are, we are people that change behavior. We Everyone on this call, you know, we change behavior. That's what I get up to do. I try to change people's behavior. I, I make them take less drugs. I make them take more drugs. I make them plant trees. I try to do things that, that makes their lives better and the planet's lives better. And, and we can make a difference. People on this call can make a difference in this space. So we should make sure that it doesn't fall off the agenda. We should find little things that people can do that keep this front of mind because it's, you know, we're just one generation. Think of your generations coming. You know, we have to think about that. We have to be responsible. And I think we have the power and ability to do that, particularly with organizations like the Marketing Society, back to you, Rich. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So Linda has launched a feedback form that's live here in our poll, but you can also scan the QR code that is on the page or in the chat. There's also a link to it. So we will be sharing um, some findings from today. And just a reminder about the Marketing Society for our non-members that have joined us today. As an organisation, we exist solely to inspire and unite our industry, helping our members do well in their roles and do good for their brands, their business and society. We have a 2,800 plus strong global network across England, Scotland, Hong Kong, Singapore, New York and the UAE. 
with unparalleled opportunities to connect with marketeers worldwide to share insights, latest thinking and best practices to challenge the norms and to change habits and be part of a powerful and supportive community. Um, so what's next from the Marketing Society? Well, on the 19th of February, we're hosting a connection and conversation event with David McQueen in London. And on the 28th of February, we'll be hosting our global conversation on the economy at 1 p.m. Uh, GMT, and that is on Zoom. So do contact the Marketing Society to join one of our events. Um, and for now, thank you. Hope you enjoyed that. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and we hope to see you soon.